Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Sarah Montague. My guest today is one of the big names of South Africa's anti-apartheid struggle. Ahmed Kathrada was sentenced to life in prison alongside Nelson Mandela on Robben Island. He spent 26 years of his life locked up. On their release, Nelson Mandela persuaded him to join him in government, an experience he didn't like. But he's never stopped campaigning for the ideals of freedom on which the anti-apartheid movement was based. So has South Africa lived up to those ideals? Ahmed Kathrada, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you very much for having me. Now, when you think back 50 years ago, what were the ideals uh, which you were fighting for? Well, in one sentence, it was for a non-racial, non-sexist, democratic South Africa. And that, that sums up uh, <coughs> our whole struggle. That's, that sums up the whole struggle. But, but for you, because there were, I mean, there were years of what became an incredibly difficult life. I mean, you were arrested, what, more than 18 times. You spent 26 years of your life in prison. There must have been times at which you thought, I don't, this isn't for me, this fight isn't for me. No, fortunately, there was no such thought at all because the activities for which we were arrested, we already knew what the consequences could be. Many of our colleagues were hanged. Others were tortured to death. Some were assassinated. So we had an idea uh, of what it could be. Prison was a bonus because many of our colleagues didn't live to see a democracy. Okay, so you knew the price that you might have to pay. But was there a moment, was there something that happened when you were young where, which you felt was such an outrage that you committed your life to it? Or was it just, was it just the way of living? Uh, it was an afterthought because I was born in a little country town about 200 miles from Johannesburg. When the time came to go to school, I was not uh, uh, admitted into the white school nor in the black school. There was no Indian school. So at the age of eight, I had to be sent to Johannesburg, which is about 200 miles away, to school. At that age, it's not politics. One starts wondering why I was not admitted into the schools of my friends. Because as children, we play. We don't know color. And you were playing alongside black yes, and, white. and white? Oh, black and white. Our immediate neighbors were white. Uh, so as children, children don't know color. You become friends, you quarrel, you become friends again. So it wasn't politics. It was a young chappy questioning why I could not go to the school of my friends. But coming to Johannesburg, of course, I came face to face with, with apartheid, raw apartheid, uh, which was not noticeable in the little country town where I was born. And raw apartheid, in what way? What, how did it manifest itself? Well, for instance, uh, for the first time now, I saw boards. Boards in front of restaurants, hotels, libraries, trams, parks. Europeans only. Non-Europeans not allowed. There were even boards that said, non-Europeans and dogs not allowed. Now. That I saw for the, for the first time in Johannesburg, not in the rural area. When you're living with something like that, I wonder how often you are angry. I mean, is it a constant sense of, of rage at the injustice? There was not much room for anger. As I said, uh, the expectation was worse. Uh, before we were uh, brought up for trial, in the, in the most recent trial, the Trevonia trial, there was a law that allowed the police to detain political suspects for three months at a time in complete isolation. 
no visitors allowed, no lawyers, no newspapers, no books. The only visitor one gets are the police. And they come from time to time with one message only. Give us this bit of information or you're going to die, you're going to hang. So you're by yourself uh, incommunicado. And all the thought in your mind is death. Because they drum it into your head. Uh, you are going to die unless you give me this bit of information. So one has to steal oneself not to talk, uh, not to answer questions. And fortunately, I managed that. The other fortunate thing is that I was not tortured physically, unlike lots of my friends and colleagues. Some were tortured to death, others survived. Uh, some went to parliament, others are still around. Now, initially, it was non-violent, but there was, around 1960, a number of things happened. Uh, there was a, the Sharpeville massacre, of course, 69 people killed. The ANC were banned, and there was a decision that actually it should, violence should start being used. How did you feel about that? About... Uh, about the ANC decision to, to actually to start using violence, to start... To make it an no, armed I, struggle. I accepted that because, uh, especially after the banning of the ANC and, uh, and another liberation organization, the Pan African Congress, the avenues of peaceful protest came to a halt. There was no other way out. Uh, and that is when the ANC set up a wing for an armed struggle. But there was never envisaged that there'll be a military victory. Because the first phase of the armed struggle was recruiting, training, recruits in the manufacture and planting of bombs. Uh, these bombs were to be planted uh, in these, uh, the targets rather were these uh, places which had this Europeans only, non-Europeans not allowed. Mm. But every recruit and there were cells of three. Uh, they had to take an oath that when bombs are planted, there'll be no injury to human beings. But there were. It didn't. I mean, the, the original intention was that it would. There, there were a couple of instances. Over the, over the years, there were numerous bombings, and there were. I mean, at least sixty-three people died as a result of that. Campaign. Yeah. Well, there was. There were a few. Uh, and if I'm correct, uh, they were done by. Uh, we call it MK, MK units, some of them uh, in violation of uh, their discipline. Now, you've mentioned the Ravonia trial, which was a very significant moment, significant for any number of reasons. It was the trial at which um, you and Nelson Mandela and others were sent to Robben Island. Um, and, but also it was significant because of what was said at the trial, not least by Nelson Mandela himself. And you've said it, it wasn't a criminal case, it was a political one. That was a very, it was deliberate policy on your part, the group of you standing trial, wasn't it? Yes, well, uh, well we had four of the most senior leaders of the ANC among the eight of us who were tried. And right from the beginning, uh, under their leadership, it was decided that this should be a political trial. We, the accused, together with our lawyers, will turn it into a political trial, not a criminal trial. Mandela, in his uh, four-hour speech, I think, uh, to court, set the tone of what the defense case would be. And it was, a, it was a tone you had all signed up to and all agreed to in advance? Yes, oh yes. And this, his, is, his this, is, where he said, this, this is what, where he said, this is what I fought for, yeah. hope to achieve, and if need be, I'm prepared to die. Yeah, that's how he ended his, uh, his address. And the rest of us, who, not all of us gave evidence, but those of us who did took the cue from what Mr. Mandela said in starting the defense case. In other words, when you go into the witness box, you proclaim your political beliefs, you don't apologize, you don't ask for mercy, and when there's a death sentence, which was expected until the very last day, there can be no appeal. 
to a higher court. So that's how the whole case was conducted. Uh, as I said, uh, Mr. Mandela set the lead and those of us who gave evidence followed that uh, example. You, that trial, um, and you wrote about it afterwards, you wrote a letter to Sylvia Neem from Robin Island where you were um, saying it's really sad to see former comrades whom one loved and respected coming one by one into the witness box to give evidence. And what hurts is when these people tell lies, some of them quite unashamedly. Uh, there were a couple who were in fairly serious positions who gave evidence. There were others uh, who gave evidence uh, uh, whose role was very, very minor. In fact, some of them didn't even know that they were, they were carrying out political work. For instance, there were uh, uh, owners of vehicles who were used to smuggle uh, people out of the country. They were told these are football teams going to Botswana. Uh, eventually, they also discovered that it was but they played ball mm. and uh, some of them were arrested also for that one of them but people betrayed you i wouldn't call it betrayed uh, you know they were severely tortured and i don't know if i would have held out under that to torture okay and there there is a, a very tight group of you who are standing trial i mean you later you you said after nelson mandela's death that you uh, when Walter Sisulu died, I lost a father, and now I have lost a brother. My life is in a void, and I don't know who to turn to. And this is as a result of your shared experiences over a lifetime. Yes, uh, Walter Sisulu played a very special role in my life. As I said, I had to come to Johannesburg at the age of eight. But as uh, the years went by, uh, and I got involved with the Young Communist League and the Indian Youth Congress and so forth. In that uh, capacity, I also met people like Walter Sisulu and others. My father, biological father, had died when I was 14. And gradually, Walter Sisulu, in fact, I regarded him as my father. I could turn to him for the most uh, personal advice. You mentioned Sylvia Neem. She was white. And when I started the relationship with her, I consulted with Walter Sisulu. And I told him, I'm, I've got this uh, association. If we get caught, it can, be, it can have a negative impact on our, on our struggle, on our organization. That was what I thought. And his response was, we are against all racial laws, including this Immorality Act, Mixed Marriages Act. Just be careful, but if you get caught, we will stand by you. And one of those members of your family, effectively, Nelson Mandela, not in Robin, you were with him for years, obviously, in Robin Island, but you shared a cell with him in Polsmore when you were after Robin Island. What was that like? Well, that was for the first time after 18 years on Robben Island, when five of us were transferred to Polsmo Prison, this is the first time we are now in one cell. Uh, on Robben Island, of course, all the 18 years we spent there, we were in single cells. Uh, of course, the only time we met and, and, and talked was at work, when we did the pick and shovel work uh, at the quarry, lime quarry. That's when we could work together and talk. Uh, once we are locked up, we are not allowed to mm. talk. So, because there were only five political prisoners at POSMO, things were relaxed, quite a bit relaxed. Uh, so to be sharing a cell, that was... We were sharing a cell until, say, we were transferred in 1982. For three years we were together in one cell, and then Mr. Mandela was separated from us. Kept at Palsmo prison, but away from us. And that is when he started talking to the other side. Now, when you did eventually get out, he persuaded you to go in government. He offered you a seat, 
but you turned down a cabinet seat. You did agree to be adv well, an advisor, but you didn't like it. And, and I wonder why, because you have fought your whole life to make, to change South Africa, and here you have an opportunity to do so. What didn't you like about it? Well, not all of us were aiming to go to Parliament. And uh, I was working in his office, of course, for the five years that he was president. Uh, at the same time, I was a member of Parliament. For some reason, I just did not like that type of life. And what you did was to set up the Kathrada Foundation, which... Yeah, that came much later. And one of its aims was to campaign for the Freedom Charter, which is, was a document from 1955, but something which talked about, it talked about freedom, all people having rights, the people sharing the country's wealth, the land being shared among those who work it, a very radical redistribution of wealth within South Africa, which South Africa is a long way from achieving. But do you think it can? Do you still want it to? Unlike other colonial countries, our oppressors were not foreigners. They were South Africans. So our policy took that into account, that these are fellow country persons not a few thousand, but a few million. Our policy had to take that into account. So that if you try to implement everything we've said on the platform and so forth, when you come into government, you've, you're dealing with reality now. Okay, but in terms of what the government set out to achieve, I mean, at the end of apartheid, almost 90% of the land was owned by whites, who made up less than 10% of the population. The aim was to transfer about 30% of that land uh, to, to blacks, and so far only 7.5% has been. It's 20 years since apartheid. Is that enough progress? Again, when we say that uh, the, uh, most of the land that, that can be used for uh, agriculture was in white hands. But again, you face the reality you're not dealing with enemies anymore. And we are not going to do uh, anything foolish by now turning these people against us. We have to work with them. The policy-wise and in practice, we didn't know how to run huge farms. We didn't know how to run industry. We didn't have engineers. Uh, we, on everything, every ministry, we relied on the white civil servant. When you look at what the senior politicians have done and the criticism that is levelled against them, um, from, well, let's take the public pr protector, Thule Mandoncella, told Parliament, all I can say to this nation and this committee is corruption in this country has reached crisis proportions. There is no two ways about it. As I say, as an ordinary member of the ANC, I have admiration for the public protector. She's there as a result of government policy. And the public protector, the constitution itself, the constitution court, these are all institutions to protect our democracy. Well, let's talk about another country where you are campaigning because you say, I think of my cramped prison cell and I visualize my fellow freedom fighter, Marwan Baghouti and other Palestinian prisoners. And you have campaigned vociferously for his release because you say that his, he's in a similar situation and sometimes arguably a worse situation than Nelson Mandela. Uh, the ANC policy has always regarded the PLO as a sister organization, as an ally, aligned organization. And that's the policy of our government as well. We had close ties with uh, the PLO, although uh, Western countries were not happy with that. When Mr. Mandela came out of prison, he was advised to break ties with, with Castro with the PLO, 
and his response was very simple to the to the uh, western leaders that when we came to you for assistance you condemned us as terrorists it will be ungrateful and immoral of us now to turn our backs on those who supported us so is it is it purely because they supported you because you'll know that Alan Butler, whose son, he, he was injured with his son when a bus was bombed in Jerusalem. He said the media have attempted to portray Marwan Barghouti as some kind of Nelson Mandela. The truth, though, is quite the opposite. Barghouti's never renounced violence and he's never shown any remorse for his prolific terror activities. Mandela has shown no remorse for what we have done. In fact, we've been proud of what we have done. Uh, we can't, con we can't prescribe to another country how they should run their struggle. My own view is I keep on supporting the Palestinian struggle once they have decided, once the Palestinian leaders have decided this is the route we'll take, I'll support them. Even uh, if that route involves violence? But I'm not going to violence. prescribe to them how they should... Is their, use, is their use of violence justified? If, under the circle, well, that's not for me to say. But if they, in their wisdom, resort to violence as the only method, I'll support them. I've been to Palestine. I have seen what it's like. It's the only colony in the world today, the colony of Israel. We have seen, I have seen in Palestine what didn't exist under apartheid, in the worst days of apartheid. So your support is unconditional? My support is wholehearted. I take the, my cue from what they do. I don't prescribe to them. So far there is no reason for me to criticize the Palestinian leadership. But the South African Zionist Federation says Barghouti is not a political prisoner but a terrorist guilty of multiple crimes against hum humanity. I'm not surprised at them. And they have tried to turn my, well, let me take it as an individual, because I've been outspoken on Palestine. They've been trying to misinterpret us as being anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic. We're not. We are critical of Israel. That does not make us anti-Jewish. Dennis Goldberg is a Jew. So many, uh, there's Ruth Slovo. I grew up with her. She was killed by a bomb. She's Jewish. So I can never be anti-Jewish and our struggle can never be anti-Jewish. When you at times think back to what's happened, do you still summon rage? Do you ever feel angry? I never did. I never felt angry. We came out of prison and before our policy was reconciliation. Following from that policy of reconciliation is lack of bitterness, no revenge, no hatred. Policy-wise and in practice, that is the only way we can go out. Because these are negative emotions, hatred, revenge, bitterness. In the end, people harboring those emotions suffer more than people towards whom it is directed. So we don't want to spend our lives with negative emotions. We have to force, face the reality of the day. Ahmed Kathrada, thank you for coming on Hard Talk. Most welcome.